process, right? No, it's because um, they had rushed that aircraft into production too quickly. And, you know, they found like, okay, you know, the avionics on this doesn't work or, you know, the mm-hmm. flapperons on this or the avionics don't work on this. We need to, you know, make an engineering change on this aircraft. So, like with the F-22, every one of the F-22s out there are pretty much unique. They don't have the same build. Oh, and that's one thing that's that's definitely found on the F-35 is... Um, there have been so many iterations on that aircraft that, I mean, like one thing you'll find like in the news today on the F-35 is they're having problems with their supply chain. Well, guess what? You know, what's the big driver behind that? Every one of those planes is pretty unique, you know? So you're saying the F-35 also has that problem? Yes, Absolutely. Yes, I mean, there's been a lot of engineering changes of it. And the biggest driver behind that is they rushed through, you know, their SDD contract, sustainment, development, and something else. I mean, they rushed through that. And, uh, yeah, I mean, all those planes are unique. And that's that's not, yeah. It's funny It's funny you, you say they rushed because most of the critics of the F-35 will say it's been delayed and over budget. Um, well, when I when I say rushed, I mean politically they rushed, and uh, I mean this this program like when you have all these different requirements uh-huh. and you have like build this sucker to be, you know, the baddest, you know, son of a bitch that ever fly, like you have to, you know, rush it through. Plus, I mean, you look at the political situation too. I mean, this this plane is built in like pretty much every state in the United States, so it's got a whole lot of political clout behind it. So, well, th- this is again going to what I'm sort of implying with the kind of empire strategy. Officially, we're in a country called the United States, and so you can see writ large how that works. Basically, they the government doles out you know money to keep the allegiance of all these different states, but they're also doing it worldwide. I mean, it's like the United Nations was an American idea. We're going to roll up the world into the American empire. Um, and they're trying to do that with the contracts overseas. Now, I don't, I don't know to the degree which that really matters. But, I mean, my point is it's, it's intentional and it's political, uh, as you're saying. It's, it's, there's a lot of uh, complexity outside of the engineering world that has to be managed. And that, um, that's really hard because... You know, unlike a, a a fighter program back in the day that was going to the CIA and nobody knew about it, you know, so basically the number of cooks in the kitchen were a lot smaller. Uh, this is a public program, and it's international and multi-state, and it's just has so many people criticizing it, requesting, dropping out, adding money. That dimension is arguably probably the hardest i would say because you know you have an engineering problem it's just a matter of time usually and and figuring out the physics of it but when you're dealing with people there may be no convincing of some people it's just there's there's no way around it like you know the divisions in the united states right now are probably irreconcilable for example and so you you don't always get what you want (laughs) and it's like you get you get kind of a cluster cluster f uh, sometimes uh, anyway, just wanted to add some commentary on that. Um, I did have uh, another question, if unless you want to talk more about maintenance. Uh, but we mentioned the the sensor suite. Hans is bringing out the helmet. Uh, yeah. I wanted to add in that the plane itself is uh, designed, or at least intended, for a network-centric fighting uh, approach to warfare as opposed to... Uh, it, you really can't remove the network from any any war obviously because you you need communications i mean that's arguably one of the most important things you have in a war uh is the ability to communicate and coordinate but the the advances in technology obviously have gotten to the point where you can have real-time information as opposed to if you imagine back in world war ii or something you would have orders but then the the intel probably was wrong or out of date because you didn't have the real-time 
ability to communicate with people. Uh, you were limited by the sort of curvature of the earth. You didn't have satellites, so you couldn't communicate over the horizon. Uh, so it was really much less uh, centralized in terms of the information, much more decentralized. You had to rely upon good judgment and things like that uh, and just flying by your wits. As opposed to today, what, what they're trying to do is they're trying to put these planes out there as sort of the forward line of reconnaissance uh, and real-time decision-making as opposed to before where you would just like go attack that thing and, you know, here's like a four-day-old uh aerial reconnaissance photo it, it may be wrong the Viet Cong may have like moved their camp of, of missile launchers uh, over over that mountain so who knows if it's still there but go look uh, now it's sort of like no you just go fly over there and then the sort of computer tells you exactly what's going on how many enemies are out there and then in addition to just the pilot that information gets relayed back to the AWACS system which has basically that funny looking radar system on top of its uh, its fuselage which is it's kind of like a commercial airliner with this big uh, it may be actually a, a, a radio tower i'm not exactly sure what that does but i think it's just for communications mainly and that's a that's kind of a, a an older version of this but where they would coordinate all the information into this one hub and then they would kind of in semi-real time send out like updates to all the different airplanes and and people who are in in charge of deciding you know what things are going to going to happen and so what the plane is designed to do in addition to the pilot is to relay all that information back to the warfighter strategists and generals and people like that uh to be able to fight more effectively um and it's a good idea i don't know how easy it is to pull off or how effective it is uh but uh it makes some sense but i think that gets to why again the software complexity just ramps up because you have all these sensors feeding all this information back in and these things have to be going up to satellites basically and then you have latency issues you have to get around that uh and then the other thing about uh the software uh, i have some numbers on this for the f-18 which is one of the the jets that the navy is going to get rid of if they take on the f-35 full-time um, that's the Hornet, and that basically is one of the um, one of the more kind of used airplanes for smart bomb deliveries these days because they're carrier launch. They they go off, and they have uh, all these variants of the airplane. With uh, basically every version has a more complicated sensor suite and uh, system of uh, targeting targeting system as well uh, for the smart bombs. Because uh, if you go back to World War II again, you're basically flying f armies of F, uh, excuse me, not F, uh, B-17s, bomber, bomber airplanes over Germany in giant formations dropping these iron bombs that have zero guidance on them. They basically just have little tails on them so they don't like flap around. They just go down straight relatively. But there's no guidance on them after that. They're not missiles. They don't know where to go. They're just dropped. And so they're carpet bombing. Um, the Gulf War demonstrated the advantage of having targeting systems on the missiles themselves. But in order to do that correctly, you have to program them for the types of targets, the sort of jamming t systems that are out there. And so it really gets complicated on the software side. And so the F-18's uh, version, so going from the AB model, had uh, 943,000 lines of code on it. Uh, the CD model had twice as much, about 2,100 um, lines of code. The night attack had three three thousand, uh, uh, so three I guess three million actually lines of code, and then um, the CD XN version had twice that, and it just keeps going up and up and up and up. So you can see like as they add in more quote unquote smartness to these weapons, it just gets like more complicated, and that's just for the the targeting. I mean, we're talking about helmets, we're talking about the sensor communications. Uh, you're talking about this stupid lift fan that's got to probably, I don't know what the pilot's role in sort of the takeoff and landing of that is, but I got to imagine there's a lot of uh, autopilot for that thing because the balancing of those things has got to be really tough. Um, so I just wanted to add in the, the details about the, the software complexity and where it's going. Well, I can, I can add a little bit more. So from what I've read, and Matt, correct me if you've heard anything different, but from what's, I guess, come out over time about the F-35s, is there plane itself runs on about 8 million lines of code, give or take. And then on top of that, there is um, an ALIS system that's sort of incorporated alongside the plane and with machines on the ground and satellites and so on. Uh, and that's 
logistics, maintenance, briefing, all that kind of stuff. That's about 24 million lines of code. Um, to, to give an example, to you know, give this in comparison, Facebook, the massive uh, organization, of tech. <laughs> the, the, you mean the photo sharing <laughs> website? <laughs> yeah, so, but well, yeah. I just I want to make a point here that like, kind of what Hank did. Facebook runs on about um, give or take sixty something million lines of code, allegedly. You can see, if you add all these pieces of software up and all these sophisticated software up, this, this is very clearly a, a very large enterprise software engineering project. Um, this has all the hallmarks of um, many of the problems I've seen in software development personally, and that I've seen uh, other people talk about in software development. Um, any video you watch on the subject of things like DevOps on overall uh, software architecture. These are huge problems for large companies that have to manage tens of millions of lines of code. A lot of it developed in-house, which create actually creates a, a whole another set of problems. You're developing internal libraries. Um, and when you read about things like uh, uh, this, this radar system, uh, this big antenna, that uh, again, re a revolutionary piece of technology that uh, uh, Northrop provided and that Lockheed kind of worked on. Um, the active electronically scanned arrays, or ASA, is uh, requires such a large amount of processing power on the plane itself. The plane rapidly has become almost like the 1980s mainframe. It has all of the hallmarks of an old IBM sort of turn of the, the 80s and 90s revolu IT revolution mainframe with a lot of integrated processing power, with a lot of IO that really hampers, I think, probably the weight, if I had to guess. Um, a lot of the heat it has to have its own cooling system just for its onboard computation. It has to have a whole set of independent arrays of wires in order to maintain those data connections and all of that consistent I.O. <clears throat> well, I mean, don't we have microprocessors? I mean, how, how big are we talking about? It's not a mainframe, obviously. So. I know. Obviously, it's not a mainframe, but it, it starts to look like it, just given its overall structure and the purpose. It's well, the radar system is no, big. I have, I mean, I have no but, idea yeah. how much processing power it actually has. I, I, would, I would say that it is probably a very, there's a very powerful Unix super for each one of these machines. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's closer to a mainframe than you might imagine when you yeah. start talking about the amount of I/O going through all of these sensors. Yeah, they probably the do actual, all the parallel stuff, but it's that's the you mainframe know, hallmark. The, the amount of math that's being done there, like the lead time on these projects, means that they're always running with ridiculously obsolete CPUs. Exactly. Yeah. So it's not going to be doing a huge yeah. amount of number crunching. There's mm -hmm. going to be a lot of offloading to ASICs, but you know. If you kind of look at overall, you know, that things like guarantees of real time, like that's just incredible pain in the ass, like making sure that every tick you update all the inputs, you run the algorithm, you mm -hmm. update all the outputs, you don't, you know, have a, uh, a stall out like, you know, a freaking uh, YouTube loading spinny logo thing when you're uh, pressing on the throttle when it's all fly by wire mm -hmm. like that. The complexity of that, I mean, it's it does approach like you know your hardcore big iron. Well, I, yeah, I, I, I agree I, with you guys that on the I, sort of operational to, level, but Hans. Yeah. I, I also have to to wonder. I mean, Matt, you said you put on the helmet and didn't work, which is sh kind of shocking. But um, at some point. You also have to account for is is this overload? It's one person flying the plane. It's not it's not a team of of people. It's not like the star. It's not the Star Trek Enterprise where you have twenty people doing you know various tasks, and monitoring all kinds of things. It's one what is guy. an interesting point because some of the uh, the fighter aircraft that the U.S. used to fly, they seem to have gone away from this. We used to have two pilots. Uh, the Top Gun had famously, you know, two pilots and F-14. As an aside, 
Yeah, and, and, and I, I really, I don't know, again, Matt, Matt, please correct me, but I really have to wonder 